Hello everybody and welcome back to another brainstorm. So today we're going to be talking about the digestive system in preparation for the GCSE biology exam. So I'm going to be splitting this video up into three main parts. First of all, we're going to talk about digestive enzymes. We're going to talk about the roles of enzymes and different enzymes that we have in digestion. Then we're going to talk about optimal conditions in the digestive system. So how does the digestive system help enzymes to work? And then we're going to round the video off by talking about the digestive system itself. And we're going to take a look at the route that food takes through the body. So let's get into it. All right, so we're going to start off by talking about the digestive enzymes. First, let's take a look at what an enzyme is. Here's the definition. It's very important. You need to learn this for your exam. So the enzyme is a biological catalyst that speeds up reactions. You might have heard of the term catalyst before. Essentially, that's a substance that's in the reaction, speeding it up, but it's not actually used up in that reaction. Another key fact about enzymes is that you need to know that they affect the metabolism. Now, you might already know that the metabolism is the sum of all of the reactions in a cell or organism. So, for example, if we have an enzyme present, all of those reactions are going to happen a lot faster, so the metabolism speeds up. Now, another thing you need to know about enzymes is what exactly are they made out of? So an enzyme is a protein strand, and with many proteins, they fold up to have a very specific shape. Now with the enzyme, it's gonna fold and it's gonna have this groove in it, and we call this the active site. That's very important because the active site is very specific to the molecule that the enzyme binds to to speed up its reaction. That molecule is called a substrate, but you don't need to worry too much about that term. Every active site in an enzyme is specific to a substrate, and an enzyme usually doesn't work with many substrates because of that. Next thing we need to understand is how and does the enzyme and the substrate work together. So here we have our enzyme, I'm going to label it E, and we have our substrate here. You can see that the enzyme has its active site here, which is specific to the shape of the substrate. And this substrate is going to move to the enzyme, it's going to bond as we can see here, and then one of two things can happen. Enzymes can help with catabolic reactions. Now these we also call breaking down reactions, where once the substrate has bound to the enzyme, a larger molecule can be broken down into two smaller molecules, which you can see here. Or we can have an anabolic reaction, which is called a building up reaction, where we take two smaller molecules and we make a larger one out of them. The next thing you need to understand is the effect of pH and temperature on enzyme. So we've got two graphs here which show us as pH and temperature increase, how well does the enzyme work? What you'll see is that for pH, each enzyme works over a limited range of pH values. An enzyme can either be an acidic enzyme or an alkali enzyme. What you'll see is that each enzyme here has an optimum pH. This could be, for example, 5. That doesn't matter. But the optimum pH is when the enzyme works the best. It speeds up reactions the most. What will happen is if we go too far alkali or acidic of that pH, the shape of the enzyme is lost. That protein unfolds and the active site doesn't work for the substrate. And the term we use to describe that is that the enzyme has become denatured. Now let's look at temperature. What we'll find is that for temperature initially, as temperature increases, the enzyme becomes more and more effective. Why? Because particles are speeding up, gaining kinetic energy, and so the substrate binds to the enzyme a lot faster. It reaches that optimum temperature where it occurs the fastest, and you'll see it drops back down to zero as the enzyme becomes denatured. Finally, you need to look at the role of enzymes in digestion. Essentially, enzymes help with catabolism. They help to break down larger food molecules into smaller nutrients that we can absorb. That's the whole purpose of digestion. There's three enzymes here which you need to be familiar with. We know that lipids are made up of fatty acids and glycerol. An enzyme called lipase breaks down lipids into those fatty acids and glycerol. Protease breaks down protein into its amino acids, which it's made up of. And amylase breaks down starch, which is a carbohydrate, into sugars that it's made of. Specifically here, maltose, but you don't need to worry too much about that. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to cover is optimum conditions, i.e. how does the digestive system make it easy for enzymes to do their job? The first thing that the digestive system can do is that it provides the optimum pH for enzymes to act. There's two examples that you need to be familiar with of en uh, the digestive system doing this for the enzymes. First of all, the stomach contains hydrochloric acid, HCl for short, and as you can tell by the name, that means it has a pH which is less than 7, it's a very acidic condition. Now there's two things which HCl does. First of all, it kills bacteria, meaning that any bacteria that we have ingested with our food doesn't cause an infection. 
The second thing is, HCL provides the optimum pH for protease enzyme. So remember we said that protease helps to break down proteins into amino acids. But another fact is, is that protease works in very acidic conditions. In the stomach, we have an acidic condition of around pH 2 to 3. And that means that protease can break down protein here as fast as possible. Secondly, the liver produces this green substance called bile, which is stored in the small intestine, uh, in the gallbladder even, and then secreted into the small intestine. Now the bile has two functions. The first thing it does is it emulsifies fat. That's a phrase you need to be quite familiar with. Essentially, fat are these big insoluble droplets, which means they don't dissolve very well in water. And that means that they're very hard to break down and digest. What bile does is it breaks this fat globule down into smaller droplets, and that increases its surface area to volume ratio, which means it's a lot easier to break down those fats, lipids, into fatty acids and glycerol. The second thing that bile does is it also provides an alkali pH in the small intestine. So you can imagine the food coming from the stomach passes into the small intestine. Now we've just said that the stomach has a very acidic pH condition, so if it comes into the small intestine where it's enzymes such as amylase, lipase, etc, they need very alkali conditions. And what bile does is it neutralizes all of the stuff from the stomach and gives the alkali pH which these enzymes need. Now the second thing is the digestive system often increases its surface area to facilitate or make digestion a lot easier. Now you've got to remember that digestion is not just breaking down food, but it's also absorbing those nutrients into the bloodstream. And an example of it helping this is that the walls of the small intestine are covered with these finger-like folds which are called villi. Now what villi do is they increase the surface area of the small intestine, which means that we can absorb as many nutrients as possible into the bloodstream in a given period of time, making digestion occur a lot easier and a lot faster. Okay, so finally we're going to look at the digestive system itself and we're going to take a look at the path that foods takes from when you put it into your mouth and eat it to when you go to the toilet essentially. So as you can imagine, you start off with food, putting it into your mouth. The first thing that happens is that the teeth chomp on the food, they break it down into smaller parts. Now in biology, we call this mechanical digestion. It doesn't really involve many enzymes. It's just your teeth breaking the food into smaller parts. And what that does is it increases the surface area for enzymes to act on it and also makes it easier to swallow. The salivary glands, which are these two glands under the tongue here, salivary glands are gonna release that protein, which we know called amylase, which breaks down starch into the sugar maltose. We've already covered that. Now, after all that's happened in your mouth, you food is going to pass through this muscular tube called the esophagus, also called the gullet sometimes. The esophagus is this muscular tube and what it does is it contracts and it relaxes to push food from the back of the throat down to the stomach. And this is a process known as peristalsis. You don't need to worry too much about that term though. So once it's moved through the esophagus, the food arrives in the stomach. We've talked a lot about the stomach already. The stomach produces that protease enzyme, which breaks down proteins into amino acids. The stomach also produces hydrochloric acid, which kills bacteria and gives the optimum pH for protease to work. And also the stomach contains muscular tissues, which contract, causing the food to churn, mix with digestive juices, increasing its surface area, meaning that digestion works a lot better. Then the next thing is we said that the liver secretes um, bile into the small intestine after it's stored in the, the, gall in the gallbladder even. We talked about the roles of bile, how it emulsifies fat and provides that optimum alkali pH in the small intestine. And the pancreas, which is very important, produces a lot of the digestive enzymes in the small intestine, if not all of them. It produces protease, lipase, amylase, etc. Now food's finished in the stomach, it's gonna arrive in the small intestine. Now this is where most digestion and absorption takes place. Protein is broken down into amino acids using protease, lipase with lipids into fatty acids and glycerol, amylase, any leftover starch into maltose, etc. And also here is where all of that nutrients are going to be absorbed using those villi that we talked about. Now after food is done in the small intestine, it's gonna pass into the large intestine. This is where water is absorbed from the food and it leaves behind that waste product called feces, which is then stored in a muscular chamber called the rectum. And then we go to the toilet, obviously. Um, in biology, we call that process egestion now. But you don't need to worry about that too much either. So overall, just make sure you're familiar with the track that food takes. Passes into the food where the salivary glands help to break down some starch. Then by peristalsis, it moves through the esophagus into the stomach here. From the stomach, it passes into the small intestine here. And remember, liver produces its bile into there and pancreas secretes those enzymes into there. 
Then from the small intestine, once all that nutrients have been absorbed, it passes into that large intestine here, absorbing all the water as it passes through, stored in the rectum and removed from the body through ingestion. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you guys all for watching. Please make sure to hit like and subscribe if you did enjoy the video and I'll see you guys soon.